Good evening or good morning everyone, depending where on the world um, you are. Um, welcome to our webinar today with Ashley Cowie, who's one of our very valued guest experts. Uh, my name is Joanna Gillen, I'm one of the co-founders of Ancient Origins. And I just want to introduce a little bit about Ashley. He's a Scottish historian, he's an author, a documentary filmmaker and also an explorer. In fact, he's a bit of an Indiana Jones type, I think, um, gallivanting around the world to all kinds of weird and wonderful places in the pursuit of historical knowledge. Uh, so we're very lucky to have Ashley with us today. Uh, normally our webinars are only open to our premium members, um, but we're very happy today to be sharing and opening this webinar to everyone. Um, which is a little bit of a Christmas gift to all of our readers. So I hope um, everyone enjoys the webinar today. Uh, in terms of the subject, um, it centers around a small hilltop village in France, and uh, that's located amongst mysterious landscape alignments. And it's also tied into some French historical characters or figures who hold a secret about this village, and that secret um, is very important because it holds great astronomical significance. Um, but I don't want to spoil the story, so I'll pass over to Ashley now to present the webinar. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and thank you again. For, oh, indeed, we've just had a slided screen. So thank you all for joining, everybody. Um, Gaul's Secret Solar Alignment. The temptation was to use Ren Le Chateau in the title because there aren't many people who have read a book about history that haven't come across Ren Le Chateau. Um, the small area in the Languedoc region of France was first written about in the late 19th century by uh, Henry Bedeau. He was a priest in Ren Le Bar, about what's well, in the proximity, six or eight miles from Ren Le Chateau. And then in the 1960s and the 1970s, um, several um, amateur historians wrote about the mystery of the priest Bernard Sonnier, Beringer Sonnier, who was said to have found a treasure in the landscapes of Renly Chateau. Henry Lincoln, um, Bajan and Lay wrote Holy Blood, Holy Grail, which seeded the entire concept that the treasure of southern France was related to the bloodline of Christ through Mary Magdalene and an entire modern mythological landscape has grown around Renly Chateau. There's seed of truth in all myth. And that has all but been lost at Renly Chateau over the last 20 years. We're gonna start the presentation by looking at Renly Chateau before and just as the mythology began in the 60s. It's a small hilltop village in Languedoc. And um, it was featured, as I say, in Holy Blood, Holy Grail. And although the town wasn't featured, the story of the priest was featured in the sensational Da Vinci Code in 2003. So Bernard um, Berenger Sonnier was said to have found parchments behind the altar in the local church in Renly Chateau. He found all sorts of curious features within and around the Renle Chateau landscapes. And Renle Chateau, of course, became iconic for landscape geometry, if you like. If you like. So what happened was Henry Lincoln, who wrote um, Key to the Sacred Pattern, he was co-author to Holy Blood, Holy Grail, discovered a series of encoded um, parchments gravestones, monuments, and through a series of um, what he would call deductive reasoning and steps of logic, he worked further and further into the mystery of Renly Chateau, getting involved in such concepts as you can see in the top right there, looking at the hidden geometry within Nicolas Poussin's paintings. And what he does is he extrapolates pentagonal geometry from the parchments extrapolates it from the artwork of famous Renaissance artists. Now, at a key moment in Henry Lincoln's research, several um, clues added up and had him transpose this repetitional pentagram onto the landscape with pencils and pens and rulers. And he took the world's imagination by storm by presenting 
an enormous hidden pentagram in the Rennes Le Chateau landscape. A pentagram that united castles, Blanchefort and Arc. It identified a central area where he found a tomb which matched the tomb that was in the painting by Nicolas Poussin, The Shepherds d'Arcadia. So from this pentagonal geometry that Rennes Le Chateau became famous for, a cartographer, David Woods, came along. He wrote a book called um, Genesis, which expanded upon Henry Lincoln's discoveries, which it, um, it was almost like an expansion pack, a plug-in, where Henry found a pentacle, David Wood found a hexagon, a hexagram, and of course then it all became blended together. And as you can see here, there's a convolution of what's termed sacred geometry, which is actually sacred geography. It's a different um, skill set, if you like. Geometry is applied to architecture. Sacred geography is applied to landscapes. However, David Wood furthered the, and almost sort of rubber stamped, because he was a leading and respected cartographer. So he kind of rubber stamped Henry Lincoln's discovery of the pentagram. And over the 80s and the 90s, it was developed upon but beneath the pentagonal and hexagonal geometric structures in the landscape, which truly are to be questioned, which we will do later, what can be proven and identified within those um, sacred landscapes of Rennes Le Chateau are church alignments. And this was a pivotal point in Henry Lincoln's um, discoveries in Rennes Le Chateau, for if you take it from the altar in the church and you run it through over the local standing stone, it touches the altar of a distant church. And when the Renlo when the Renlo Chateau landscapes mapped and the churches are plotted, you do have alignments of three churches, sometimes almost four. And David Wood um, presents several which fall on the circumference of a circle, which as you're going to see is just taking things a little too far. Laying out alignment in the landscape is relatively easy with staffs and people. Spherical trigonometry is an altogether more complex and needless application of intellect. So, church alignments within the Rennes Le Chateau landscape. There's me, bottom left, Carcassonne Castle. The Rennes Le Chateau landscape is based upon, unified by, built around the Paris Meridian, which was existent in Paris and used by early topographers and cartographers until 1884. And the Meridian Conference in Washington established the Great Meridian to be London, the Greenwich Observatory. So, Rennes Le Chateau, in a nutshell, before we move onwards to a mystery of very, very similar proportions. Rennes Le Chateau was famous because it had hilltop church with alignments which integrated Neolithic and early Gallic sacred sites, standing stones, cromlechs, earthen mounds. Those alignments hinged upon alignments with the solstices and the equinoxes, the northern and southernmost rising points of the year, and the day when the sun rises perfectly east and west. All of the alignments seemed to stem to and from the Paris meridian. And there appear to have been several archaeologists and scientists in some ways in the know regarding Rennes Le Chateau presented as if there's some great conspiracy of the Priory of Zion which has been completely debunked now but that was presented that there was some kind of inner circle of people protecting the Rennes Le Chateau mystery however there were certainly archaeologists Henry Bordeaux in the 1890s possibly the early 19th, uh, 20th century was finding alignments of cromlechs in Rennes Le Bain just beside Rennes Le Chateau. So, hilltop churches, academics in the know, alignments with the solstices and equinoxes, and um, keying in to the Paris Meridian. Part two, we're gonna transpose ourselves from Rennes Le Chateau here in Languedoc, all the way up here to the French Comte region in the Jura Mountains. Alsace Saint Rain, famous for one of the most iconic battles in human history, the Battle of Alsace or the Sieges of Alsace. It's impossible for me 
for any historian to truly describe the political, socio-economical and cultural changes that came upon or after the 54 BC Battle of Alesia. 80,000 Gallic Celtic warriors were united from 53 tribes by Viking Getrix, possibly the most iconic Celtic leader of all time, who faced 45,000 troops led by Julius Caesar. The Battle of Alesia was fought around this red dot here, which was part of the Flanders region of medieval France, but it has been populated and inhabited by people since the Paleolithic, all the way through the Neolithic, all the way through the time of the tribes of Gaul, through the medieval to current day. The Battle of Alesia, of where it was fought, remained a mystery, till this man came along. Alphonse Vincent de la Croix, who's an archaeologist and the architect of Bissasson. He built the Faculty of Sciences, part of the Archaeological Museum, and he built the entirety of the Antiquities Museum. In 1956, de la Croix was speculating and surveying the landscapes around an ancient French town known. Elise, he got to suspecting what if the great battle recorded by Caesar was fought around the town of Elise, right here. And he announced it and he found it. He found the podium of Elysia, the center of the Gallic kingdom. He found an enormous hill fort which would have housed tens of thousands of Celtic people. And he was made famous for having discovered where the famous battle of 54 BC actually unfolded. Now, Marie-Louis George, George Colomb, he came along as an amateur archaeologist. He drew some of the first political French comics on the political scene. He was convinced that the Battle of Alesia was not fought where Delacroix has asserted. He was convinced that it was found or fought 170 miles to the southeast in the small French town of Alesia. Now he was so convinced of this that he went out onto the landscapes and indeed he found what he called were traces of major gigantic blockades because one of Caesar's blockades measured two miles. It was said to be 40 meters wide and 30 meters deep filled with all sorts of traps and spiked and pieces of wood, carnage. However, this man believed that the battle was fought further south. Now, <clears throat> along comes Xavier Guchard, a French director of police, and again, another amateur archaeologist. And just like um, Sonnier over in Rennes le Chateau, he spent two decades surveying the landscapes around Alicia. He came to the conclusion, having monitored the Gallic Celtic locations, the medieval castles, that a great level of geometric, topogra topo topographic and cartographic measuring abilities were held by the ancient people of that area. Henry Lincoln in his Key to the Sacred Patterns said the very same thing about in the Chateau. The secret leading to the great lost treasure is hidden in byways measured out by our ancestors, long distance alignments between mountains and sacred sites, in particular churches. So Gouchard um, published in 1936, Elus Elis, he presented 
a schematic, organized, formulaic landscape, which had never been seen in history before. What he presented was a system of 24 alignments within a circle centered on Mount Pope, just outside Alais. One every 15 degrees, his star, or um, one hour for every 24 hours of the clock, expanded from Elias and encompassed various European cities. It was a wonderful work of the creative imagination. And he talked about these rose de, vin rose de vents that he um, claimed emitted across spiritualized landscapes from Elias. It was, um, it was a work of genius, but based on archaeological observations he had made within the alignments of Elysian landscapes. He noticed that the towns, the cities, the villages, and the settlements along his Alasian landscape alignments were prefixed with a lace. A lace Laurent. He had over 400 town names and village names prefixed with a lace. Just like at the same time, Alfred Watkins in England was presenting ley lines. And in those ley lines, he, he um, believed towns and villages and settlements were prefixed with the word lay. So, you have a lay or a lease in France and lay in England, both sets on both topics and completely um, arguable. Okay, however, let's keep on moving with this because this is when it gets good. Gouchard believed, like in Ren Le Chateau, that an ancient meridian existed in the Lacian landscapes. If you look here, here's the lace in the landscape. This, he believed, was the ancient meridian, which ran beside a town called Mayon, a bit less than a mile and a half from Elise. This ancient meridian was structured around Mount Pope, which he believed was the sacred and set, the sacred center of the fulcrum, the um, spiritual pulsing heart of the ancient Gallic landscapes. So he described the French landscapes in quite some detail, you can see, he was using lines between these, um, what are Gallic mounds, if you like, anything between two and 3,000 years old, tribal sacred sites. But then he noticed that the um, Mount Pope was center to this entire thing. So his system of 24 alignments centered on Mount Pope beside Elise. Now, that, was hard enough for the archaeological world to accept. Why would you lay out 24 lines? There's no practical purpose for it. Although it has numerical correspondences with the clock and the compass, 24 times 15 degrees with 360 degrees, it doesn't bear any practice. It's not a tool. You can't stand in a laser on Mount Pope and look up one of 24 lines and monitor the sun or the moon rising. For example, the sun doesn't rise in the north, so arguably seven of the 24 lines, or eight of the 24 lines are redundant. However, he went even further. He claimed that the Greek Aleutian mysteries, the mystery schools of Greece, had in prehistory mapped the globe and established a series of sacred sites, temples of offerings to the Aleutian mysteries all the way through France and Gaul. And he claimed Alessia was central to this entire lost global grid. He was one of the architects of the whole concept that Stonehenge is linked with the Great Pyramids, that's linked with Angkor Wat, that's linked with my goodness knows what. It's just gone so far out of proportion. However, he started looking at the numbers connected to his maps and he saw that Elise was on the 47 North, 558 five, degrees. Um, line and Alicia was separated by exactly nine degrees of latitude, therefore six degrees of longitude, nine and six, both triangular numbers. In the head of Gouchard, that must have meant design within the landscape. Of course it does. What else could that mean? Coincidence and luck, but he didn't think about that. However, coming right back from we you know we've taken Gouchard to the end of a plank here i'm about to push him over having for having gone too far but it wasn't just Gouchard that realized there was something exceptionally important going on in these landscapes 
researching the alignments of Gouchard, I was to explore the cemetery of Alicia, of Elise. And in the cemetery wall in Elise, there's one monument, one bust, the bust of Delacroix. The archaeologist who lived 70 years prior, the archaeologist who discovered where the Battle of Elise was fought 170 miles further northwest. What on earth was his bust doing in Elise? Why did he choose to have his bust at the center of what was to become Gouchard's, the central spiritual system, his entire matrix of 24 lines? Delacroix is at the center of it. The bust was set there in 1873 by all of the academics, architects, the clergy of the area. They all came for the insertion of this bust in Elise. Now, that in its own could be taken as just as a remarkable coincidence. Maybe, like all of the, the, the later archaeologists, maybe Delacroix believed himself that the battle was actually fought at this location. And in his acceptance speech to historical society, I believe in 1886, he said that the landscape in Elise compared to Elise in the north was so remarkably similar that it was a thing of wonder. So did Delacroix have some archeological information like Coombs did who believed to have found a massive rampart around Elise? So the questions starting to emerge is, was the greatest battle, one of the largest and most seminal battles of world history, fought at a different place here where Delacroix's bust is centered? Everything gets a little more complicated and more mysterious. When we look a mile and a half away and we find in the next village church, on the surrounding wall, there's one bust, one bust, and it's Coombs. Coombs who believe the Battle of Elise was fought here in Elise, not 170 miles north. He also has his bust inserted here. So we've got Delacroix and Coombs, two archaeologists, two cartographic experts who both surveyed the landscapes would have their busts, their posthumous busts inserted at the heart of what later became Bouchard's sacred landscape. Both, I mean, yeah, look at this. Coombs's body is buried 400 miles north in Brittany, yet his bust is at the center of Neil. Delacroix, well, his body was buried up at Bissessant, yet his bust is at Lace. So, what I got to doing was asking myself, what relationship, if any, might these two busts have with one another? <coughs> Excuse me. The fact that they're both within the vicinity of the remote French landscape around this hyper-spiritualized area that so many have talked about, something of mystery. So I got to plotting them. If you plot a line from George Coombe's bust, in Mille, to Alphonse Delacroix's bust in Alice. It follows 120 degrees, which is exactly the alignment of the rising winter solstice sun while standing at Mion Church. This here is the solstice axis, uh, this is the solstice axis for this particular latitude. This line on the solstice would get progressively more angled as it went north and flatter towards the equator. Right here, Coombs's bust and Delacroix's bust follow the local winter solstice or midwinter solstice axis. Luck. There's 360 possible angles that they could have chosen, or 180 arguably. But no, they both find themselves located on the solstice axis. So from this, one has to ask, we have two churches in the landscape which fall in alignment with the solstice. 
just like we have in Rennes Le Chateau. We have two churches in the landscape which fall on an alignment with the solstice. We have two historians like we have in Le Chateau who not only seem to be aware of this alignment, but they have their busts installed upon the alignment. What if, what if one were to expand that alignment to its um, maximum capacity, if you like? What if one were to draw it towards the setting, summer solstice in the northwest and southeast to the rising winter solstice sun? That's what happens. Merry Christmas, friends, and your archaeologists don't find that very often anywhere in the world. Alignments were installed in landscapes since 4000 BC. They're, they appear across the entire Maya and Inca kingdoms of Peru and Mexico, respectively. We find alignments from sacred platforms in Tewanaku to sacred mountains. There are alignments in Cambodia between hospital temples and mountains, between solar temples and mountains. China had mountains flattened to enhance the flows of perceived energy across alignments, but nowhere in the world can you find eight churches located on a band of less than 50 miles to an accuracy of less than one degree on the land. And what I mean by that is standing here at Coombs's bust and looking at the rising solstice sun, which comes up here on the 21st of December, the sun is going to be seen rising above Delacroix's bust. And from Delacroix's bust, the sun is seen rising over Levier Church, and so on and so forth. But equally, standing at Ogin's church, on the setting of the summer solstice, summer solstice sun, the sun is going to be seen set across this alignment of churches. So you're going to ask yourself, yeah, look at that. Ash is presenting us with a map that's taken from approximately four miles in the air. That line there, that must be about three millimeters. That line represents 200 meters on the ground. He's at it. He's selling us a bag of crap. That is what everybody at Renly Shadow does. That's how you mystify a landscape. Depending on the width of your line, you can haul anything into alignment. But look at this. Look at the accuracy of this alignment of churches. It is a thing of archaeoastronomical beauty. It is a thing of cartographic wonder. It's a thing of geographic and geometric splendor. Look at how it crosses not just the church, it crosses the transept. It crosses where, where the transept is here where people enter. Two within meters on the ground. And here again, it crosses exactly at the front door of the church where people enter. And here, which is just my favorite, at the George de Glace, you have it crossing the center spire of the church. You can see the shadow of the spire here. So this alignment is, is stapled onto the landscape with a precision that outstrips any single piece of sacred geometry or landscape geometry that's been written about in Renly Chateau. This is not a thing of chance. There's eight of them, and they all fall into perfect alignment from sacred center to center to center. So, why? Why would church builders, medieval church builders, between the 15th and the 17th century, build an alignment, a soul steel alignment of churches. Would they? Did they know anything about it? Might they just have built on earlier sacred Gallic, Gallic sites? I think so. Because five out of these eight alignments already have evidence of Neolithic sites beneath them. 
they're all perched on the tops of the highest rises. So they're natural places of inhabitation within flat agricultural landscapes. Over time, these sites were rebuilt on and rebuilt on, and the medieval church builders came along, may not have been aware of this alignment at all, so happened to build their churches on top of the earlier sacred sites. And I'm stepping back all the way to the Neolithic, of course, and some of these with Paleolithic evidence. So what I'm going to suggest is church builders knew nothing about this, but what they were doing was building upon an earlier established Gallic. I keep calling it Gallic. The temptation is to say that it's probably arguably Gallic, although the people were from Gaul and the Gauls. However, so, so what we essentially are looking at here is the solstice axis that was worshipped upon by tribes stemming from 3000, 4000 BC all the way through to the Iron Age and the event of the church builders or the collapse of the, the Celtic tribes in the sort of third, fourth and fifth centuries. Now, one has got to ask if this is a soul steel alignment that was used once a year, how on earth then might this plug into Gushar's sacred mountain, the highest mountain in the region? Neolithic cultures from, well, Newgrange in Ireland is a great example. I believe it was 2400 BC it was built in perfect alignment with the rising of the winter solstice sun. Just as these, this alignment here is aligned with the rising of the winter solstice sun. May is how in Orkney was aligned to the setting of the midwinter sun. The setting of the midwinter sun. The setting of the midwinter sun. Let's come back to Ion and a lace alignment. Here's the basic church alignment. This is the section we began with. From Elias, from Delacroix's bust, it is no coincidence that on the setting of the mid-winter sun does so at Pine Mount Pope. System complete. This is the axis for the rising midwinter sun. It rises here and it sets behind Mount Pope. The alignment of eight churches, therefore, absolutely does plug into the ancient landscape. Meaning by that is the highest mountain would have been regarded as the residence of the male god since time immemorial, as it was all over the world. So what we have here are the alignment of eight churches, which plugs into the Mount Pope winter solstice alignment. So the, the, the criminal thing in all this is that Gouchard missed it. And the reason he missed it was because when he started to get a sense of these alignments within the landscape, rather than doing what we just saw here, which is mapping out something that's almost predictable, we know that they worshipped on the solstices. So it's almost predictable to find an alignment, if you like. What's unpredictable is what Gouchard tried to do was try and find an expansive alignment of 24 alignments that extended throughout Europe. Because what he failed to realise was in his assertion that 24 alignments extended out from a little town in France, and upon that look were located all these cities throughout Europe, that Madrid, for example, or Luxembourg was built because of its locational properties in relation to lakes. They quite simply weren't. So in itself, within its own system, Gouchard's um, assertions can be negated. It doesn't take me to do it. But what I think is important here is now we look at how this reflects on the Renly Chateau mystery. Finding a series of eight church alignments in the um, French landscapes, it tells us one thing is that it is not unusual to find this. So for Henry Lincoln, Bayesian, Lay, Wood, and all of the tens of authors, hundreds of authors written about the sacred landscape of Renly Chateau, what they must consider is that alignments aren't as unusual as they think. But instead of questioning what the alignment might have meant to the people before the church builders, no. 
what seems to happen is they've gone along a more mythological geometric route of complication where an alignment is part of a pentagram or part of a hexagon or a united pentagram and hexagon rather than just an alignment it's almost like there's a need for more for more for more so at every every um, research project like this there is a branch where the researcher has a decision to go that's it i've done it i've discovered that which was lost a really important alignment of churches which were built upon ancient tribal sacred sites and that's and, and so so here we have an archaeological revelation which needs so much more study and we can actually do that all going well we're going to announce within the next few months that we're going to come here next year ancient origins and myself and a film team and we're going to go and we're going to try to manifest this um, alignment on the landscape with film however there we have it we've got the lost alignments of the lace which brings Ren Le Chateau perfectly into now look just as we head towards the end of the thing here I'd just like to tell admin that there's no questions showed up and um, they might want to just have a look at that before we get towards the end I can see there's a lot of people in attendance here and there must be questions um yeah so so further reflecting on the Ren Le Chateau thing we have all the components in a lace that we have in Ren Le Chateau historians involved landscape alignments solstices We've got castles and churches and chapels in alignment. But I think we're looking at two completely different things. We're looking at ancient solstial solar alignments, and that's it. And then what we do is we project these Holy Grail Priory of Zion, Knight Templar-esque paradigms over these simple, simple systems of solar worship. And um, that's what I'm going to put to you is that somewhere beneath the Ren Le Shadow mystery, somewhere beneath the priest and his treasure, between the pentacle and its gold, between the painter and his alignments, between the, the priory and its parchments, there are some ancient, ancient Celtic alignments there that are screaming to be understood, that are screaming to come back to the glory that they once had, which was being known about, being seen and manifested in the landscape because from one of these locations to the next you can see you can see you can see and beautifully in this system when you come from the likes of Levier before you get here there's a blind spot but what you have is a cross on the top of the mountain so there are waypoints when the church is out of sight in this alignment that is a whole project for next year we're going to look at the Renly Shadow landscape in this kind of sense whereby you draw all of the alignments so steel in a landscape and the, the, the sites that fall within that alignment pop out. So you, you do as you refer to it. You don't look for a line, you don't look for the sites that make the lines. You lay out the alignments and look for the sites that fall upon them. So I'm going to bring this to an end by leaving you with this graphic here, which shows you how this church alignment falls on. You can actually see here, this is a Bouchard's map. He didn't add those red lines, I did. But what he did notice that the Mayon and the Lace, he marked the sun symbol to mark sites that he thought had relationships to ancient solar worship. If only he knew about these eight churches, if only he had extended it. But it would look like Coombs, whose bust is there, Delacroix, whose bust is there, on the alignment, certainly knew about this thing of beauty. So let me check my email to see if admin has sent me anything. Excuse me for two seconds. Hi there. Hi there, Ashley. We've just got one okay. question. Um, so I'll read that out. Um, with all these alignments having been purposely created in the past, how did the knowledge of them get lost over time such that we are left to discover them in modern times? Purposely, uh, purposefully kept secret? And that's a question by Kevin. Yeah, and Joe, I can see a couple of other questions showing up there and this actually answers the next one as well. By Anne. It's a great question, and, it, and the, the reason is, the reason is, this is the reason, technology, why would I need to know an alignment in the landscape that indicated a time of the year when I can touch a button? Now, we always, haven't always had smartphones, 
but the evolution of astrolabes and compasses and cartographic systems and skills replaced the requirement for going out onto the landscapes, landscape with a staff and knowing such alignments. They weren't creating the alignments. What they were doing was marking out the alignments. Alignments are created by the sun. That's the thing we've got to remember here. The sun is doing the same thing every year, but on that special day with its least amount of light where everything changes, your fingers stop falling off with frostbite, the family lives, crops grow. On that day, you've got it marked out and everybody within your tribe knows. But with the replacement with, you know, churches on the, on the alignment with town clocks, you need not look into the sky to see where the sun is, to know when to plant the seed, when to harvest the crop, when to take in the wood. You would, you, you don't have the requirement for the sun now. We have watches and we have church clocks. So everybody could look up at that church clock and they knew exactly when the year it was with shadow and with dial. So I don't think there was a conspiracy. And it's the same way in 500 years time when you someone's going to mention a smartphone. So someone's going to say, did they, did they even exist? You know, technology gets replaced when we forget. So somewhere 2000 years ago, the astronomical knowledge of how to look at the sun and its shadow to know when and where to worship or when to plant seed replaced with technology. Thanks, Ash. A couple more questions. Um, we have a question from Jennifer. Is René Le Chateau a smaller piece of a much larger, larger puzzle? Yeah, but not in the way you think. Here's the thing. I think René Le Chateau is part of an ancient French Neolithic landscape that has been fragmented and built upon, and people found evidence of alignments within the ancient landscape there. I've found it here in the lace. People have found it all over Europe. I mean, and these are these things do pop up. They're wonderful when you get one as beautiful as this with eight sites in it. That is rare, rare, rare. Nothing to compare with it in Europe at the moment. And but um yeah, these these are fragments of the Neolithic landscape. So the part the bigger thing is the thing that's been missed with all the myths. It has nothing to do with the Knights Templar, Mary Magdalene, and Holy Grails and Bloodlines of Christ. This is to do with solar worship in the ancient world. Okay, thank you. Another few coming in. We've got a question from Walter. Are you actually familiar with the Masons bringing Wood's pentagram from René Le Chateau to Philadelphia, that city planned according to the pentagram in France? So, um, Walter, that is really interesting because I know about David Wood's pentagram and I know all about the the, the, the work that's been done in Washington, Philadelphia, on the street alignments and whatnot. Um, I, David Wood's pentagram, to be honest, I met David Wood six, 14 years ago at a Sony Society book talk, and I watched him for six hours present his geometry of Rennes Le Chateau. And I had, a, I, to be really honest, had an issue with it from the start, because here's the thing. He was presenting 10, 11, 12, and 15 sites desperate by maybe 90 miles. And he was showing that they were accurate to within millimeters on the ground, that the centers of these churches were within pencil distances. Oh my goodness, I had four scientists that day all say the same thing to me. The problem with this system is, is in the perfection. Land movement, subsidence over 10 or 15, there's going to be movement. But when you present perfection, it's when you've got perfection like that in one part, it says that all part is probably not right. So I personally don't really buy into the Woods methodology and system. And here's another problem I have with David Woods' pentacle, to be really honest. He stood at, at giving a scientific talk about it as a leading cartographer and said with his own language that this landscape alignments, alignments could not be achieved with poles from mountains. It could only have been done from 450 meters in the air. He was implying that there was a flying platform to draw out that pentagram in that landscape. I switched off like that, and so had everybody else that needs a, you know, reality and to know what the actual historical seed is within the Rennes Le Chateau. By following that wood system, you're going down a spiral, an infinite spiral of geometric confusion that is um, so if we're, it could have been transplanted in Philadelphia or, or wherever else, but within its perfection, I tell you, there's imperfection. Okay, and another question from uh, Shelley. Was the forest of Fontainebleau 
excuse pronunciation, it's probably terrible. Um, another place of secrecy for this knowledge as well as used in more ancient times. Can I ask you to repeat that question? I missed the start of it. Yeah, yes. Was the forest of Fontainebleau another place of secrecy for this knowledge as well as used in more ancient times? Yeah, it's it's. I, we filmed in a similar forest in the north of France. I forget it where Merlin was said to have died, the, the tomb of Merlin. These are mythological projections over ancient landscapes that happened in the medieval times between you know the Grail romances of the 12th century. Wolfram um, von Eichenbach pretty much brought this whole mythological landscape and that transferred upon the French forests. The French forests were always places of hunting and have been since 4000 BC and earlier since Paleolithic, Paleolithic times. And so here's the thing, Here, let me answer this a different way. Are the forests, and is that forest in particular sacred? You know, the first evidence of humans in France was 1.57 million years ago. People have hunted the forests of France for 1.57 million years. It's it's so beyond sacred, our words don't define how sacred and how important these places are. And these sites with where natural energies, I'm talking about water and heat, are most abundant. We've had 1.57 million years of some of these places being revisited. So certainly that forest of Fontainebleau and all other forests in France have just infinite time and heritage of constant relays of mythological and um, hypothetical legends because within all the legends you find seeds of what i've just shown you here astronomy alignments and whatnot when a classic in french or in celtic mythology is the lion and the unicorn that appears in the crest of great britain you know the lion represents the sun the orange sun and the unicorn the white um, moon you know the unicorn lion chases the unicorn through the sky and they eventually overtake it's overtaken by the unicorn it's the moon transgressing the sun throughout its monthly cycle so astronomy underlies all of the Celtic mythology. And yes, forests are places that generated myths and housed myths and embellished them especially. Okay, thank you. Another question from Simon. Um, how would the Gallic people have situated these sites so accurately? And were the churches built at similar times? That's a great one. Yeah, how did they do it? So that's how they did it right there. You would be utterly amazed what you can do with two sticks, like just holding them and sighting with one eye. Now, with two pens like this, I can get an accuracy of one mile. If I tell my friend to walk off in a mile, left a bit, right a bit, left a bit. As long as he's keeping in alignment with those two sticks, I know of good accuracy. Now, if I was to monitor these sticks out across the landscape every 20, 40 meters, I'm going to adhere to within way, 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 way less than 10% of a degree of the landscape. You can do but here on this example, we've got a 49.47 mile alignment. And as you can see, look at the accuracy of how they pass through the transepts and the crosses of those churches. So, but this was done in Neolithic times. It was done with staffs and it was done with ropes. Staffs and shadows where you set a shad staff up on the top of a hill. And on that sacred day, the 21st of December, the sun rises you just rope to the shadow and you've roped your winter souls to sunrise line. So staffs and ropes, everybody thinks there's lost knowledge. There's not. What's not available any longer is our ability to perceive the simplicity of what's been lost. We didn't start with watches and develop sticks. We started with sticks and develop watches. So to find the mysteries of the past, we have to use the tools that they had, which are sticks and ropes and stones. And that is how the modern world was built. It's only in the last 30, 20 years we've been digital. It's only in the last 100 years we've been locomotive. But up until then, it was greatly done with wooden ropes. So staffs and ropes. And if you go to my website, ashleycowie.com, there's an article there about Tewanaku. I recently discovered a very similar alignment in Bolivia, modern day Bolivia. And it was done with sticks and with ropes. And I kind of recreate it there. So the simplest of skills, simplest of skills. That's why I say the landscape geometry with the pentacles and the circles that requires spherical geometry over great distances is going too far. I don't think that that exists out with the imagination of those authors, because not only is it virtually impossible to do with sticks and ropes, why would you bother? Why would you draw out a pentacle in a landscape? It's worthless. 
useless. You can't see it. You can tell someone about it, but you can just tell them it's there anyway without having to have done it. it doesn't play any practical purpose at all. Therefore, again, with its in, within its own system, logic negates it. Mm -hmm. Okay, a question now from Kevin. Uh, do you know of any good examples in modern architecture that is following the concepts of such alignment? Go again. Aloha. I think I heard that question. I'm going to go for it. Is there anybody? Yeah. Well, you know, there's. I've got over 400,000 words published in the last two years about landscape alignments, landscape measuring systems, cartographic systems, map building, spiritualization of landscapes. I've got studies in Khmer, Cambodia, in um, Inca, Peru, and Bolivia. So. My stuff's up there, and if you were to go and look, I've got a whole portal of links to archaeoastronomers who are currently working. The, who, the name I'm going to throw at you is the who I call the king of archaeoastronomy, Professor Clive Rudels. He's, for the last 50 years, studied the measurements of Alexander Tom in the 60s, all the way through to um, Hedges, Doogie and Hedges, all of the, the, the modern archaeologists in the north of Scotland and Broadgar and up in Orkney there. And, you know, Clive Rugels is the man who really has what you would call the firmest grip of the reality behind archaeoastronomy. He doesn't get involved in the spiritual interpretation of the alignments he finds, but he gets involved in the science of how the alignments are made and how do you draw out these things. And he finds the platforms at the sacred sites and he does exceptionally um stringent scientific measurements from these sacred sites so clive rugels is right up in there and anybody else i told you is, is kind of either going to be quoting him or trying to be him but um yeah professor clive rugels okay we don't actually have any more uh questions that have come through i'm not sure if you have any more questions from your end do you ash yeah, I've got one here, Joe. It's just come in here. I've got it actually cheeky, cheeky. Someone sent it by email through one of the articles. <laughs> right. The, the, the question is, it's quite, it's quite simple. It's a yes or no. Is Do I think the Ren Le Chateau mystery is a lie? It's a really, really interesting question because it, it's, it provokes and just it needs one answer, which is a yes or a no. It's, it's impossible to answer because what you've asked is, is the Ren Le Chateau mystery a lie? You, I've got to remind you how wide and expansive that Ren Le Chateau mystery is. If you were to ask me, do I believe the church alignments in Ren Le Chateau exist? I would say, to a certain extent, some of them certainly exist. If you were to ask me if I think the Holy Grail is buried there because Mary Magdalene escaped there with Joseph of Arimathea and founded the Grail colony, I'm going to say, I think it's an absolute lie, yes. So depending on which part of the Ren Le Chateau mystery, what I do know is this, and I think it's where the best place for me to leave this. I was fortunate enough to meet Henry Lincoln some 14 years ago. I did a tour with him in Orkney. I found similar alignments again to this in Orkney some over a decade ago. Henry Lincoln said to me then that 99% of everything in Ren Le Chateau was a lie. He's the guy that's written three books about it. He also, to the day I see him on videos on YouTube, people are turning and telling him that they've solved the mystery, they know where the treasure is, and he looks at them and goes, but it's all made up. And they look and they say, no, Henry, you're wrong. He was the composer, he was the artist, and he's saying that 99% of it is absolutely wrong. So I'm gonna go with Henry Lincoln on this. I truly don't believe that man has told a lie in his days. He was an actor before he was a writer. He's one of the finest storytellers that I've ever met. The man can keep you entrapped like any actor can, but he is a living storyteller and has never claimed to be anything but. And I don't think he's lied. And if he has, it's been a lie so deep to himself that he's convinced himself of this entire thing and he's managed to hold it up. There's skeptics. There's a lot of people out there who don't believe a word of it. But that's the trouble with it. You can't just throw the baby out with the bathwater. If we threw out Gouchard's discoveries of the alignments in a lace in the 1950s, 
I would never have come along and found that alignment of eight churches and sacred sites or Neolithic sites. So I think, you know, it's, whether it's a lie or not, you've got to take it seriously enough to look to see what the kernel of truth is. Even if it's a lie, what seeded that lie? There's something in it. And um, I believe it's just the, the Neolithic landscape mythologized over time is what we're looking at next, but not a lie. Misinterpretation, that's the best way to put it most often. <laughs> That's great stuff, Ash. Thank you so much for that. Um, it's a fascinating look into hidden history, and I think in many ways it could be worked into a bit of a Dan Brown um, series for one of his next titles, so we'll have to look out for that. Um, so anyone interested in hearing more about Ashley's investigations, he does tons of this kind of thing, um, you can check out his website, which is ashleycowie.com. Um, it's also got lots of um, videos and documentaries uh, books and lots of good stuff on there. So check it out. Um, if you can just flick over, Ashley, to the, we've got a final slide um, which has a Christmas offer code. Are you able, do you have that on your presentation? I think it's on your last slide. This is my last slide. I don't think oh, I've okay, got it. Oh, no, no, I, uh, I forgot to, I, I think they send it to me. Okay, never mind. I'll just I'll say it. <laughs> so we have a Christmas offer at the moment um, for anyone that wants to join our premium website. So the premium website gives lots of um, add-ons and bonuses that you don't get on the main website. We've got webinars like this one. Um, we've got interviews with experts. We get priority um, passes on our expeditions, uh, giveaways, eBooks, in-depth articles, lots of great stuff. So. Um, we've got a 30% discount at the moment, which is our Christmas offer. And to take advantage of that, if you wish to, um, you just need to use the code CHRISTMAS2018. Um, so it's CHRISTMAS2018. And uh, you just go to the premium site, which is members.ancient-origins.net, if you want to take advantage of that. Um, our next webinar coming up is in uh, January, 26th of January, and that's with Ted Lukes, and he'll be talking about the 10 plagues of ancient Egypt. Um, so we hope to see many of you there next time. Thanks again, Ash, for, for our presentation today. Good night, Thanks, everyone. Everybody. Thanks.